regions. And we had an idea of what was going to be a part of that planning document. And then the planning document came out on the 17th of July. And that gave us a framework of putting our plan together and also the necessary components that need to be a part of it. So although there was some opportunity for us to have some um, choice than to have things that were put into place that were contextual and had something to do with our district that would be different from some other district, we had quite a few things that were given to us as parameters. We had another group we were working with, the New York State Department of Health, and also the Fulton County Public Health Department, who we work with very closely and have established a very strong relationship with over these last few months, that um, they have their own pieces that need to be a part of it. And our plan will be submitted into two different portals. It'll be one through the New York State Education Department, and the other portal is through the New York State Department of Health. And that will be done, um, that will be done by tomorrow. We are also still operating underneath, no, we're back on the other one, we're still operating underneath some executive orders from the Office of Governor Andrew Cuomo. And that is helping to de define some of those parameters about how many students we can have in and how many staff members we can have in. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more tonight. The school attorneys, uh, because there have been times when all of all three of those entities perhaps had um, some conflicting information that we're getting some guidance on what something means and which one we are to follow if we have competing guidance on a particular topic. But most importantly, we're also dealing with some really good collaboration with our colleagues. So it's talking to other school districts in our region. I have personally been a part of a joint management team, which is all of, well, we have four different BOCES and a number of superintendents and representatives from those BOCES getting together and talking about, as a region, what is our capacity, what can we do, and sharing ideas as we're putting together our plan. Thank you. I want to give some thanks and some public recognition to our school reopening planning committee. A while back, we started talking about three phases in our school district, and I, I don't want to get it too confusing because in the state, they started talking about phases as well. Our first phase was when we were closed and uh, we were looking at learning resources. Phase two was once we knew that we would be closed for an extended period, and we started implementing some more educational experiences for students. And phase three was that idea of, well, we're getting to a point of, of coming back to school and a little bit of recovery of normal or a sense of normal. And we were thinking last year, last spring, of what that might look like. And I, you know, I'm really pleased with the thinking of everyone in this district as we were putting our ideas together and formulated our own phase three plan we had certain sections that some of our staff members were working on. For example, in our health and safety group, we had all of our nurses with whom I met um, very frequently in the very beginning. And by the end of the year, the school year last year, we were meeting twice a week and talking about things as they were happening and planning for what it might look like um, when we got back together and dealing with a lot of the health concerns within the community and the school itself. And we had our, for example, our counselors, school psychologists, and our pupil services folks talking about social emotional learning and some of those other needs our students were having and um, some of the coping strategies that they were having to implement and some of the real problems that I know a lot of you folks were dealing with at home as well and how that was affecting our students in a number of ways. Well, there's a social emotional learning portion to this as well. So in getting our components and chapters that we were looking at ended up being very similar to the content in this outline here. This outline is the outline of our plan. And you'll see that there's a purple box around instruction, talking about technology and connectivity, teaching and learning. And we have to put a plan together that spoke to in-person instruction, remote instruction, and also hybrid instruction, which is a mixture of the two. Special education and also bilingual edu education of world languages, our ENL students. 
But the content itself starts with health and safety and looking at everything from health checks to social distancing, face coverings, PPE, the infection control strategies that we'll have in place in the district, management of ill persons and contact tracing, health hygiene, cleaning and disinfecting, vulnerable populations and accommodations, visitors on campus, and school safety drills. Then the next chapter is facilities, and that's our physical plant itself. Part three is on food services. It's meals that happen both on-site and off-site in our remote learning. Transportation, a chapter on school operations, which encompasses school schedules, attendance, extracurricular activities and athletics, and uh, child care, CTE, and some of, some of those other things that um, we have been thinking about and are part of our plan as well. Two other things that are very important. One is our staff with teacher and principal evaluation systems, and also thinking of certification and incidental teaching and substitutes. The last section is communication, family, and community engagement. And I want to thank our JEPTA leaders and our PTSA who are very helpful in, in helping us identify ways in which we can increase and enhance our communication of this plan and of this very challenging special time that we're in as we consider bringing students back to school. You know, this closure has been very challenging for all of us. And one thing is for sure, as we've been thinking about our plans and as we've been thinking about what the fall will look, look, look like, we know that it's not going to be like it's been before, that our learning will be very different and that our expectations of everything going back to normal are just that. They're just expectations. They won't be reality and they won't bear out. So we have to be prepared for various things happening within the community, and whether it's staff or students, or let's say an uptick in COVID-19 related illnesses within our county or within the Mohawk Valley region, or something that um, is nearby that ends up affecting us. So we have to be prepared for whether we're going to be in, in person to the greatest extent we can, because remember, we all want students to come back. We all want everyone to be back to the greatest extent we can. And um, it's those other entities that are giving us the parameters under which we can have students coming back. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that plan tonight. In the first part we're going to be talking about under our teaching and learning is technology and connectivity as part of our reopening plan. This is Hareth. All right, thank you. I'm Rachel Hareth and I'm the Director of Technology for Johnstown School District. And I'm going to share with you a little bit about um, the technology portion of our plan. So one of the requirements for our plan is that we had to describe how we would meet students' technology needs. So this year, whether we are under an in-person model, a hybrid model, or a fully virtual model, we will be providing devices to all students pre-K through 12th grade. Um, we found that during the virtual spring um, session, we asked families if they had devices, we provided Chromebooks to any students who didn't have a reliable device at home. But what we found was that even if families had devices at home that they felt um, were suitable and that we thought would be suitable, they didn't always have the most up-to-date software. They didn't have every system that was compatible with the platforms that we use. So in an effort to make things simpler on our families and our students, we are providing all students with um, typically Chromebooks. Um, for most students, there are a few pockets of students that will receive Windows laptops um, because those students require uh, more robust software that won't run on Chromebooks, but for the most part, it will be Chromebooks. And again, that's under any model. And if we are in either a hybrid or in-person model at any point, we will have the students bring their Chromebooks back and forth to school each day. And that will also limit the sharing of devices and spreading of germs. And then we also have to provide information about connectivity for our families and students. Um, so just as we did in the spring when we closed, um, we will be providing wireless hotspots to any families who don't have sufficient internet at their residence or their childcare location. 
Um, last year we did this as well. Um, we are switching to a different type of hotspot. So we did have some families um, who used hotspots in the spring that um, had data limits on them and they weren't always completely reliable. So we are switching to a more reliable platform that does not have data limits. Um, and we also will be providing wireless access to our school parking lots that will be installed this fall. So families will be able to come onto our property and connect to our wireless from outside. And then we also have to provide um, training and instruction to our students and families. And you know, with this hybrid learning and with the virtual learning models, there's a whole lot that needs to be learned. And last year we used Google Classroom for our K through 12 students. Um, and we found that while Google Classroom worked pretty well for our three through 12 students, um, it was not, entirely the best solution for our K through two students. Um, there's There were some features of classroom that made it a little bit more confusing for those families. So we are switching to a different Seesaw or a different platform called Seesaw for our K through two students. And we will provide training to both the students and families on that platform. Um, and then we are going to continue to use Google Classroom. It says three through six on the slide, but that is a typo, I apologize for that. It will be grades three through 12. So um, we will be providing more training on Google Classroom for students and families um, in Google Classroom than we did last year. So last year, we, as everyone knows, we didn't have much notice about the closure. Um, we kind of scurried to get everything onto Google Classroom and we didn't quite have time for all of the training that we would have liked to do with our students and families. So we will be providing more robust training for Google Classroom um, for three through, three through 12. And then for students, we also are providing digital citizenship instruction, and that will in, be included in their curriculum in various ways, depending on the grade level. Um, so that will be things like how to care for the Chromebook that they're given and how to behave appropriately online, how to participate in a virtual meeting just like this. Um, and, you know, just in general, how to behave well online. And then we also will be switching to the Zoom platform for our meetings. So in the past, we have used Google Meet and that's the platform we're on right now. Um, Google Meet has some limits and Zoom has a lot more features that will be beneficial to our students and our families and our teachers. Um, it has things like virtual breakout rooms. So the teacher will have the ability to um, have a meeting room that has maybe three students in it and then another room with another three or four students and the teacher can still pop in and out of those rooms and um, interact with the students. So we are making that switch, which will require some additional instruction for students. So we will be providing that to students as well as to families, because so often you as families are there helping the students along the way. Um, and then we also are providing technology supports and training to our families. Um, last year, we had an online form that families could submit if they were having trouble logging into a Chromebook, logging into whatever platform was being used. Um, but sometimes when you're having technology trouble, you can't access the digital form to get the help. So we are making a slight change this year. That form will still be available um, and we are making it a little bit more readily accessible. So we, we will put it on the website where it's a little bit easier to see. We'll also be linking it up to ClassLink, which is our app dashboard. And we will also be introducing phone support. So there will be a phone number um, that will be posted on our website that parents can call and they can call that number and receive some basic tech support. And then if it needs to be escalated to a technician, it can be done so from there. Um, so we're hoping that those things will improve the overall interaction with technology. And that is um, our technology in a nutshell. So I will turn it back over to Dr. Galen. Thank you, Mrs. Harith. And I know that um, all of those changes are going to make it a whole lot easier for the user and make it not about the technology and the problems, but instead we can focus more on teaching and learning. And that is one of the changes that we're going to see. Um, one thing that is for sure is those assessments are going to happen. Um, we've been told that the three grade assessments will happen, that the regents exams will happen. And it's all about for us as educators then, thinking of those standards and meeting those standards in perhaps a very different way 
but also keeping in mind that there are a lot of things happening to families and to individual students as well. So learning isn't as easy as showing up to school and learning as it may have been for some students in the past. That um, you know we still have these, these health concerns to consider as well as a number of economic concerns. So things are very, very different. And so our learning and the way we do it will be different. Mrs. Fanton, do you want to talk a little bit more about what our plan shows for teaching and learning? Absolutely. So my name is um, Nicole Panton. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Professional Development here at Johnstown. So in order for our schools to reopen, all schools had to have certain criteria met. Um, so we'll go through each one of those criteria and then go into our individual plans that we developed. So the first one was that we had to ensure educational equity or that all students um, would have similar experiences or be able to meet their needs. Um, our team, our teaching and learning team considered multiple models um, and our building principals have built multiple schedules to ensure that all students are being met um, based on what they need as individuals. The next big piece that we had to ensure was that we had a continuation of learning for our students, regardless of what model we end up in. And so in-person interactions have to occur when we have in-person opportunities. But when we don't have those in-person opportunities, we had to ensure that there were daily interactions between students and educators. And so we had to develop a live virtual meetings. So using that Zoom platform that um, we are going to be switching to. All live interactions that we do provide for students will be, pre will be recorded. So in the event that a student is unable to attend a live meet, they would still be able to see the recording of it. Our hope though is that our students will be able to attend those live meetings so that they can interact back and forth with our teachers. Um, but again, we will be providing those in recorded format as well if they aren't able to attend. We also had to make sure that we had um, for our students. So this is where we really looked at our um, building, um, looked at our classrooms, looked to determine how many students we could fit into each classroom with six feet socially distanced. We looked at repurposing different areas of our school buildings to see if we could use those for um, educational spaces for our students. So looking at our cafeteria and repurposing that into a classroom, looking at our music rooms, our art rooms, um, anything that has large spaces that we would typically use for a special area. However, when we did that, we quickly learned that by doing that, we would um, not be able to have our students leave their classroom all day long and our students would be forced to be in one classroom all day long um, without much movement at all. Um, and that's not good learning environment for students. So that was quickly something that we took into consideration as we were going through the planning process. So a lot of questions came in about when are masks required. So masks are required when a student is riding on a school bus um, due to the constraints that they have while riding on the bus. So we must have all students wear masks if they are riding on any of our school buses. Um, the next piece of guidance was if a student is not able to be six feet um, in terms of social distancing or it cannot be maintained, then students would need to be wearing masks as well as our staff. Um, anytime our students or staff are in the hallways, masks must be worn. And anytime that they are using the restrooms, masks also must be worn. There was other guidance that provided for certain situations where the activities would require projecting of voices, such as singing or playing instruments or doing aerobic activity, such as a PE program, where we would need to be able to provide 12 feet of social distancing, otherwise masks must be worn. So health checks was another big question that we had. How will these be happening? Um, at home symptom screens will be conducted by the families and these will come through Parent Square so that you would be able to um, easily type in whether or not your student is having any of the symptoms that are part of the COVID-19 symptoms, um, as well as a couple other questions regarding travel and, and temperature check. But actual temperature checks will be performed at entry um, when your student arrives at school by trained um, staff here at Johnstown. And this is not a limit 
limited to only your students being screened. Every single staff member and every single visitor will also have to go through the same screening process and temperature check as well. The next big piece was that we had to teach and train all staff and students on proper hand washing and um, respiratory hygiene. So those will all be things that we'll be doing through orientations throughout um, the first weeks of school, um, as well as making sure that our students are aware of how to wash their hands, the proper protocols behind um, respiratory hygiene, um, and many other things that go along with the COVID-19 awareness that we, trainings that we have to do with our students. So when we looked at the fall 2020 reopening plan, we really did use the guidance documents that were provided to us by the New York State um, Department of Education, the New York State Department of Health. Um, we also looked at our executive orders and I want you to understand that the plans that we have in place for right now are not static. <laughs> they, they will be changing as things change in our environment. Um, and they are not meant to be long-term, hopefully not long-term. Um, so as these plans will be reevaluated often. And as we get further guidance from all of the entities that we have talked about um, that are providing us with guidance um, and including executive orders, we will reconsider our plans to ultimately get to that goal of allowing all students to be back in person as long as we can do it safely. So we are going to discuss three different models that we have um, that we had to provide for our plan. So we had to look at an in-person, a hybrid and a virtual model. At this time, our plans currently accommodate for all whole student pop populations to be served through one of these models. Um, we expect to learn next week from the governor, um, an executive order that would allow us to understand what way we can go um, and what additional things that we need to potentially consider. Um, once we get that executive order and those details, we'll be permitted to um, move forward and start planning and implementing our plans that we have. Um, but there is potential for blending some of the models in the future as well. So what is our in-person model? So we spent quite a bit of time looking at the in-person model and trying to figure out if we could even do this. We worked with facilities, we worked with our teaching and learning team. However, um, at this time, we cannot provide an all in-person um, model um, due to several reasons and not one stands out over the other. Um, social distancing requirements, as I talked about earlier, we looked at every single classroom that we have. We measured them out, looked at square footage, um, and in order to socially distance and also the student, um, the classroom capacities being at 50%, um, we were unable to do it for those reasons. Our transportation was another concern and another constraint that we have that we don't have enough buses or enough ability to do bus runs um, or multiple bus runs. So at this time, transportation also played a part, but not a full part. Um, capacity, again, and staffing constraints. So we can't just um, reopen buildings that we've closed and staff it because we don't have the staff to be able to staff those places. Um, in other areas where they might be able to look at uh, models where they're bringing back all of their elementary students, they're providing a minimum of two classrooms for a whole cohort. Um, and so to split them because we are still operating under a 50% capacity in each room. Um, and if we opened up another building, again, that would require the additional um, supervision. Um, it would require additional administration and also approval from our state ed department. So there's a lot more that goes into reopening buildings and that. So that was not an option that we had at this time to be able to do um, due to the fact that we don't have those staff to be able to function in that manner either. So at this time, even though it is our goal to go forward into an in-person at some point, we are not able to do so at this time. So we're gonna look at our hybrid model for our students. And there was a lot of questions that came up with our hybrid model. So we'll go through a lot of those um, and address a lot of those concerns that you had through this model. So here is what um, our students would be broken or how our students would be broken up. Our students would be broken into two groups, the purple group and the gold group. Um, each group will attend 
two days of instruction in person and three days of virtual instruction. Um, and on the chart, you can see the days in the, that they would be in person versus the days that they would be virtual. And a, as a reminder, we did um, consider a model where we had students coming in Monday and Tuesday as one group and then being virtual for the remaining days or the second group coming in Thursday, Friday and being virtual for the beginning of the week. However, when we looked at that, our students would be away from us for more than five days or uh, five days um, versus the three days in this model that we have. And one of the biggest concerns that we heard from our students was that they felt disconnected from our staff. So this was all students, um, not just our students that struggled the most and who are at risk, but all students all the way up to our highest performing students. So we really took that into consideration and heard our students loud and clear that they wanted to be able to come and be able to connect with our teachers as much as possible. So when we look, one of the most asked questions um, from Parent Square was how will our students be assigned to the purple and the gold groups? So our first priority is to ensure all sibling groups were in the same group so that that would help families um, so they didn't have to worry about childcare at different points in time, um, but really to prioritize making sure our siblings went to school at the same time as each other. Um, this also supported our transportation runs by doing that as well, because we can have st siblings sitting next to each other, if people that, um, students that are living in the same home. So that also helped. We're also considering our transportation runs and making sure that we can um, fit all students um, from each group. So we have to balance our runs to make sure that they can still get on their bus routes that they have. We are also looking at student services and their needs, student programs, course selection for our seven through 12 students. And then again, that building capacity and making sure that no class that we have will meet, go above that 50% capacity that we have. Another big question that we had was the August 21st date was seemed a little late, um, especially considering that families need to make arrangements. So this is our this is our very last date. This is a guarantee that you will have it by then. Our our ultimate goal is that you will have it by August 14th. And the reason that we cannot guarantee that it will be August 14th as we are still waiting for executive orders to come in and we don't know if it will truly come out next week. Um, that's what they're saying. But again, we need to hear that so that we can finalize our plans. In addition, we also are working with our transportation department to finalize their bus routes. And as soon as we get those final bus routes, then we can finalize our grouping that we have. So um, it's not that we don't wanna provide this information to you sooner. It's just that we have some other constraints that are holding us back from guaranteeing that we can provide it to you any sooner. So August 14th is our our hopeful date that we will have it to you, um, but you will be guaranteed that you will have the information by the 21st. So looking a little bit farther at that elementary and the hybrid learning model, um, when students are in person, it will be a typical day for them that they had. Um, the classroom may not look typical or what they had seen from past years because the reconfiguration of the classrooms does have to occur so that we can accommodate for social distancing. So students will have their own individual desks um, that will be socially distanced so that we can ensure that there's that six feet between our students. Um, so, but for the majority of them, our students will still see a typical schedule that they would have run through. At home, there will be live instruction and we'll have a minimum of two opportunities for the live instruction while they're at home. Um, one of the great things that we were able to build in with our elementary principals was a, a program called What I Need. And this is individualized attention for our students um, whether it is AIS or academic intervention supports that they might need, or it's enrichment for them in ELA and math. So that was really exciting that they were able to build this into their schedules to ensure our students would get targeted support um, in small groups as well. In addition, we would be doing a homeroom check-in. So this would be the opportunity for the whole class. So the whole group of students, so if you're in a second grade classroom, typically we have between 
20 and 25 students. So they would see half of their friends that are in the classroom in person learning and then half of the staff or half of the students would be at home on a Zoom meeting and they would still be able to interact. This is where they'll be able to do some of the um, more of the routine building, checking in to make sure that they're doing okay, make sure that they all understand what they need to be doing during that time. Because one of the most important things for you to understand is unlike in the spring, this really has to be continuity of learning. So each day our students will be continuing their learning from the previous day. And it's really essential that they are completing those um, online assignments. Um, otherwise they will be behind. And um, starting in this year, we will still be using the same grading policies. We will be reviewing our grading policies, but our students will be graded. And as Dr. Gillen talked about, our students are still accountable for the Regents exams and the three through eight exams as well. So that's something that we do just need to be mindful of um, that there's not a lot of flexibility there other than it, they will be able to complete those things at their own time, but on that day. So we really want our students to consider themselves at school um, during that school time. And we understand again that there are um, family issues that we're going to have to work through and be flexible with. But again, um, just know that there, there's supports that will be available as well. Um, the on-demand information, um, a lot of questions about screen time and, you know, I don't want my child watching a, a computer screen all day long. Um, that's not necessarily on demand either. So we still have the ability to provide our students with workbooks um, where they could be doing a paper and pencil activity. They could be doing a project that this teacher has them doing. It does not necessarily mean our students will be sitting on the computer for six hours a day. Um, so this, that is something I want to stress that we do keep that in mind. Um, and that is something we are concerned about as well, but it will be very, um, practical instruction, hands-on engaging instruction for them. So one of the things that um, Mrs. Harris had talked about earlier was the idea of using Seesaw. So one of the great features is um, the student may have Seesaw up on their computer, but they're actually reading a hard covered book or a picture book to their teacher and recording themselves reading. And the teacher will be able to interact back with them with a voice recording over um, giving the student feedback about their work. The same thing they could be um, doing a paper pencil activity, take a picture of it, and the teacher will respond and provide feedback. Or they could be talking through a word problem that they're doing and saying, you know, here are my steps that I'm working through and this is how I'm getting there, which is all part of the discourse of our math program that we have. So lots of great things that we have um, for our students, but again, not necessarily our students just sitting on a computer screen all day long. So what does this look like at the secondary level? It's very similar um, to our elementary level, except for our students are running an eight period schedule um, as they would typically if they were here in a traditional learning format. Again, if they're here in person, they would be running that schedule in their eight periods that they have. Um, and then when they're home, they would have a minimum of two opportunities to connect through a Zoom meet for check-ins and also for individualized support as needed. Um, as we get farther into the year um, and as we get better at what we're doing, there'll be opportunities for us to be able to offer more live streaming um, opportunities where the students could actually see the live teaching if necessary. So those are things that we are working towards. It's just not going to happen necessarily in the first weeks of school. Um, additionally, these will also be recorded just as the elementary will be recorded. So if they're unable to attend or see, um, they would be recorded. Um, but attendance is required regardless of our students are at home or virtual. So we would be tracking attendance through our learning management systems. So Seesaw for our pre-K through two and for our grades three through six, it would be through the Google Classroom. So they would have to show accountability by completing the assignments that and the check-in periods that they had um, so that we can track their attendance as well. A lot of questions also came up about the school day and the schedule and what the hours would be. Our hours for elementary will be the same hours that we had previously. So 8.30 to three o'clock. And at our 
secondary level, it'll be 745 to 230. So there's no change in the time that the students would report for their in-person learning. So what does our virtual plan look like? At the elementary level, it will reflect the same type of schedule that we have for the hybrid, except for we would be in a virtual setting. So our students would still be broken up into those same two groups, the purple group and the gold group, and they would be provided time each day, four days a week to have live instruction in ELA and math and specials and what I need. So those were the areas that we really prioritized. We made sure that we were sticking with the fact that we don't want our students necessarily on live Zoom meets all day long for six hours. That's not what we wanted, but we ensured that they had many lessons of instruction. So those live Zoom meetings could run anywhere from the minimum of 15 minutes to 30 minutes for instruction. And potentially in some cases where a teacher might ask certain students to stay back and do additional support sessions with them. So those are also opportunities. Every day our students will have a homeroom check-in so that they can check in and meet as a whole group. And on Wednesdays, our building principals really wanted to prioritize um, building culture with our students and, and working through social emotional learning, um, still honoring our students through their achievements and their successes. So they will be creating a building wide morning meeting that they would have every Wednesday. And that's in both models as well. For our sixth grade population, it would be slightly different than our K-5 in the sense that science and social studies would also function as ELA and math. So they would be getting live lessons in, in social studies and science as well. Um, not saying that our lower grade levels will not have any science or social studies live, but that will be integrated into their ELA and math instruction. The secondary model looks a little bit different than the elementary model. In this case, we would not be using the purple or gold groups. Instead, our students would be all grouped together. And this is because our secondary students um, have, it, it's easier for our students to be able to get onto a Google Meet. They have better self-regulation skills. Um, so we can have the whole class or that whole group that would have been in period one um, attend a live meet and get the instruction that they need. Um, one of the things that we were concerned about was having our secondary students though run a full day schedule um, and be on Zoom meets all day long from 7.45 to, um, to 2.30. That just did not seem practical to us. And the teaching and learning team really felt strongly that they wanted to be able to have dedicated time with the students and not have them feel exhausted by the time they got to period eight. So um, Mr. Hale and um, the teaching and learning team were able to create a schedule that would allow our teachers and our students to attend periods one through four on Mondays and Thursdays, and Tuesdays and Fridays, they would attend period five through eight. And they would have a modified schedule. So we know our students at the secondary level do not like getting up early in the morning. So their start time would actually be 8.30 and they would end their Zoom calls by 12.20. They would also have a 10 minute break in between each of the Zoom or the live meets. Um, and then they would be able to transition to their on-demand learning that they have. Now it's really important again to remember that the on-demand learning that they have is a really a continuation of their learning. So it's learning that maybe pre-recorded lessons by a teacher and maybe assignments that they're completing to be successful with the next day's instruction. Um, it's really up to the teacher and what they determine is most important for them, but all of our instruction will be um, driven by standards-based instruction. So in addition to all of that, in terms of the virtual model, we also will be providing virtual office hours. Um, all of our staff will be providing the opportunity for teachers and students to connect um, in a one-on-one, -on -one, um, whether it is um, or in small groups. So that will always be provided for our students. Um, Mrs. Lent will also speak a lot more in depth about our special ed services, but all support services such as OT, PT, speech and counseling will all be provided to our students um, who have them on their IEPs or 504 plans. We also will be providing daily social and emotional learning, which is something that we had to prioritize 
um, for our plan to be able to go through. And um, Dr. Gillen had talked about that was one chapter or one part of our outline that we had to provide as well. And this is really to support our students who have been through trauma, help um, with regulation of emotions, how to cope with stress, how to handle certain situations that are not always easy for them to handle. A lot of the mental health um, supports that we also can be providing at that point in time as well. Um, and throughout this whole process too, whether we're hybrid, virtual, or in-person, our students will still be able to get breakfast and lunch while they're here, or even if they are not here, um, breakfast and lunch will be still provided. Um, one last little piece, um, and I spoke about it a little bit, but I do want to remind you that our grading policies um, will be looked at again and we'll be working with our academic committee to see if we need to do any refining of those policies. Um, our elementary um, K-5 will be going to a standards-based report card starting in the fall. Um, this was a, something that we had already discussed and um, planned on doing prior to all of the COVID-19 changes and closures. Um, and we will be going into a trimester model for that. More information from our building principles and the expectations of grading will come out in orientation so that you'll have more detail about grading and what that really looks like. And that'll also be emphasized with our students as well. So I'll turn it back to Dr. Yellen. Yes, there were a lot of questions. And first of all, I want to thank you for your questions in advance, because I think you'll notice, especially if you had participated in the Board of Education meeting last evening, we have enhanced this presentation quite a bit to incorporate a lot of the questions that you asked us. And um, we, this is, we said earlier, this is the first of our meetings. We plan on having a series of these meetings and trying them at different times of the day as well, so that as many parents as possible can ask those burning questions. And that might even make a difference also in how we're crafting our plan together and some, wherever we might be able to make a change, we'll do that. But I tell you, most of those questions that we had are things that we've already put into the plan but have not had that opportunity to communicate yet because it's so early in that process. And that's part of the reason why we're here this evening. So we do have our Director of Special Education with us this evening, Mrs. Lent. Okay, so yes, you already introduced me, Mrs. Lent, Director of Special Education um, and Special Programs. One of the things that's very important to us, obviously, is um, making sure that all of our student needs are taken care of. And we know that our students with IEPs, individual education uh, plans, really have a lot of needs and services that we need to make sure we're addressing. Um, in, our pro in our plan, English language learners and students that are already in small class sizes for our 811 and 1211 classes are going to have the opportunity to attend school four days a week. Um, they're already in small classes, and so we can separate them and have social distancing um, for those students. And they have a lot of services and needs that we want to make sure that we can fit into their time with us. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday are the days that those students will be attending in-person school. Uh, Wednesday will be a virtual learning day where we will, as with the other students, it'll be a blend of some of those on-demand um, pre-recorded lessons, presentations from the teacher, um, some Google Classroom activities that are set up, um, and seesaw assignments for the younger students, and check-in times with their service providers or teachers for extra help as needed. Um, we're going to be making sure that all students that have these IEPs will be provided for in-person, whenever possible, services for speech, counseling, OT, PT services. Um, anytime we can't provide that for some reason, we will continue to provide it through teletherapy, but we feel very strongly that we'll be able to do that in person, having them here four days a week. Um, and But that is for all of our students that have an IEP, whether they're in a small class size or any students that receive services, we're going to make sure we try to fit those into the days that they are in person if we're doing a hybrid model and they get those services while they're with us because we know that that's the best method of providing that. Um, communication is going to be very important through our office and with all of our staff 
as much as this information is changing and we find that students have changing needs or different needs, um, maybe they have new goals or different goals based on what's been occurring, we'll have to maybe touch base, we'll have to have new meetings as things arise and we'll just be in constant communication throughout this process. Um, another thing I wanted to mention that with the virtual and with especially the hybrid model, um, the fact that a lot of these lessons are being recorded for the on-demand portion, a lot of our students will benefit from that because they can watch those lessons repeatedly if they need to. And in the plan, um, there are a lot of opportunities that we didn't have when we threw our plan together overnight virtually and the teachers did the best we could, um, but we're really building in purposeful times for our special education providers and everyone to have that time to check in with our, our students um, as much as they need to for that help throughout the day. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is there's questions about outside placements. So our students that have special education programs that they attend in other places, whether it be HFM BOCES, or we have students that attend other programs outside of Johnstown. Um, we don't have final word from those places yet. We've had preliminary discussions and some conversations about what those might look like, but we have not heard for sure what those plans are. So as we do, um, we at Johnstown are dedicated to make sure that there is transportation and that all of our student needs are being provided for to get our students to those programs and make sure we communicate with you as soon as we do have information about those as well. Okay, Mrs. Cook is here too. She oversees our transportation program and there have been some questions about transportation as there always are. And we do have some changes with transportation this year. So even if there wasn't a pandemic going on, there would be some new transportation routes and some new guidelines. So we're doing our very best to get that information out to you as soon as you can. And with some more details about answers to the questions you've asked in advance, we have our assistant superintendent, Mrs. Cook, Hi, um, just a couple of things. There'll be a lot more details coming about this, but I just did want to, as Dr. Gila mentioned, really kind of hit the high points of the questions that we are getting. Um, first of all, for bus transportation, we're adjusting our bus routes. So we've looked at all of our routes and we're adjusting those to reduce the number of students on each bus for any given run. There will be seating arrangements that will allow us to maintain six foot social distancing. So the seats will be assigned and, and students will be able to only sit in, in seats where they can maintain that social distancing. With the exception of students who are from the same household will be able to be seated together. Um, masks must be worn when the students are boarding the bus while they're riding the bus. So even while they're seated, they'll be wearing those masks and when they're exiting the bus. Um, a quick note about um, the, the cleaning and disinfection buses will be cleaned and disinfected twice a day after the morning runs and after the afternoon runs. And high touch areas will be cleaned if we have to, for example, um, make two runs on a bus for elementary in order to maintain social distancing. We'll make sure that we're hitting all of those high touch areas in between those times. Hand sanitizer will not be provided on the bus, but will be available at school for the students. <clears throat> a couple of other things. There have been some questions about arrival and dismissal patterns. The principals are looking at those patterns in, in each of their buildings, and we're also working with the transportation department on that. And so looking at both the, the bus arrivals and dismissals, as well as parent pickup and drop off. They're analyzing those traffic flow patterns and adjusting their traffic flow, both with the vehicles and with the students entering the building to maximize social distancing to the greatest extent possible. And be looking for transportation information soon. So you'll be seeing more soon coming out 
um, through Parent Square and also through the school website. Additional information as well as uh, the permission forms for people who are interested in um, opting into transportation if their students qualify for transportation and they haven't uh, used transportation in the past. And I did want to mention one other thing that Mrs. Lent had alluded to. For those students who participate in out-of-district programs, for example, some of our students with special needs, we will be providing transportation to those programs any days that those schools or those programs are in session. Okay, Dr. So you've heard a lot about our, our plan. It's certainly not every piece of it. We were focusing this evening mostly on, it was two different things. One, teaching and learning, and then those most frequently asked questions. Um, we did have 120 different questions that were raised, up, raised, and we are putting together a frequently asked question document that we're going to be posting, and as more questions come in, we'll certainly be um, answering those questions too. And as I said, having more opportunities like this. But there's a few things for us to just make sure that as parents, we're taking away from this more so than anything else. And that's um, trying to share that information. We'll be sending it from the school district as well, but reinforcing with our students that things are going to be different. And as they're coming into school, it'll be different than any other year. One of the things Mrs. Cook just said is something that um, could be a big difference in and of itself. Just what door do you go in when you show up at school? It might be very different from the directions you've received in the past. And we also know that when our students get together, one of the first things they want to do is run and hug and, and hang out with each other. And one of the sad and challenging parts about right now is we can't do that. This is, uh, we're going to be reinforcing that, that idea of social distancing. And we all need to do that. And as we've been told, uh, whether it's from the CDC or from um, other leaders within the state and the Department of Health, and also from our own Fulton County Public Health Department, is we, the more we all do our parts to maintain social distancing as much as we can and wear masks whenever possible, that we can do what we can to help slow that spread and to get back to normal as, as soon as we can. Um, it's just not gonna be anytime real soon. So what are we doing now? We're finalizing the first plan iteration. There's a good chance that big portions of our plan might change between now and the beginning of September but we've at least had an opportunity to share with you the beginnings of the plan. We will be submitting it, our deadline to stay dead. We did have an extra buffer of another week, but we should get everything into them tomorrow because we have finished our, our first draft of our plan. And that submission is ready to go to the Department of Health tomorrow, as well as the State Education Department. We will be doing more section communications, such as there have been some um, real good questions raised about how we plan on cleaning and sanitizing. And we want to share those portions of the plan. So it does a couple of things. One, it's just good communication and letting folks know what we're going to be doing. But it also puts a lot of minds at ease. As we're um, making our way out of our homes and some of us are just barely getting out and, and widening our circles with people that we're coming into contact with and thinking of coming into school, you're very concerned that there'll be a lot of people here or what's it going to look like and how do we, how can we ensure that things are going to be cleaned and sanitized the best we can. So we'll make sure that we communicate those sections um, in more detail when we have an opportunity to do so. Our plan itself will be posted on the website and it will be posted by those sections. We're working with some, um, some experts, much, much more expert than I, to make sure that we get them on the website in a way that's easy to follow and it will be according to those sections and section titles. Then as things change, we will be highlighting and dating those changes. So we'll be able to see at a glance and you'll know at a glance what's new on this page that I need to know. And we'll be utilizing color and a coding system to the best of our ability. So very quickly, if you're familiar with the plan, and let's say that you, you've got it now, what this hybrid plan is all about. Well, if there's a change made to it, you wanna be able to see very quickly without reading that whole plan, what do I need to know that's different? And we'll do our best and we'll also be to communicate it well. And we're also going to be looking for 
um, those kinds of hints and feedback from you on what works well for communication for our families. You also, I'm sure, heard a lot of opportunities for trainings in what folks have said so far this evening and what our leaders have shared with you. We have training for not only our staff, but we have training for our students. And we have um, some of that training that you heard about, whether it was the hand hygiene or the respiratory hygiene, those are critical portions of our plan that all school districts need to do. So we'll be doing some age appropriate training. We're also increasing our signage around the school as reinforcements to that training. And we'll be sending out some links for videos to watch at home. So if you wanted to see it yourself and see what your student is being taught and trained, it, that will be very helpful. You know, one thing to think about as a parent is um, not only that face mask, but that water bottle. So thinking of how we get water in the school day, um, one of those recommendations is that all of our students has his or her own refillable, reusable water bottle with a name on it in, in permanent ink. That's going to make a difference in taking that back and forth, as well as having some kind of a mask, whether it's a, a no-sew option or some kind of cloth covering. We'll have links to places where you can make them very easily or um, different ideas on reusing some materials around the house to do that. And if students have one that's comfortable, that he or she, um, you know, fits well and it feels good, we can, you can get them into a habit at home of you come home, empty out and rinse out your water bottle, clean out your mask, let it dry. The next morning they're right there and you get them ready and you go. Um, it's those habits that are a little different but need to be added into that routine. So as you're looking at school supplies and thinking about the beginning of the school year, that would be a couple of things to keep on your list. So the governor's announcement that we were talking about is something to keep in mind as well. It's expected to be next week before the 7th, between the 1st and the 7th, we're being told, and that will have a big impact on what our plan will be. So as we were talking about the hybrid plan, we know that coming in two days right away, all right, so that's half of our school population coming in at a time, um, even that is a big stretch from where we've been and to implement all of the training and do the screenings that we need to do with our younger children and some testing and helping children feel comfortable with all the changes in the school, whether it's knowing the directional arrows and which way to go in which hallway or what's the up staircase and what's the down staircase. Um, as we're training all of these things, it'll take a little bit of time. So our thoughts are once we get started, our first three weeks will be one day in person. And that way, if we have a purple group coming in on Monday and Thursday, we'll have half of the purple group on Monday and half of the purple group on Thursday. So there's only a quarter of our school population at a time. That'll enable our staff to do a real good job of getting to know our students real well establishing relationships with new teachers and with their classmates, getting to know the routines in the school and feeling comfortable with that, and helping us um, fill in any kinds of gaps that we have to make a good plan for meeting the individual needs of our students, especially at this critical time at the beginning of the year. So if we do that for just those first couple of weeks of school, those first three weeks, then we'll be able to go into two days at a time with the hope that eventually we might be able to take that Wednesday and have purple come in one Wednesday and then gold come in the following Wednesday. So we could get to a point where we're coming in three days. And of course our hope is, as um, soon as it is possible and safe, we would be bringing everyone back and um, getting to it. Everyone is referring to as our new normal and our new sense of normal. But um, as you've heard this evening, we're not at a place to do that right now. We're using the notions of equity and social emotional learning and taking care of um, all of those critical portions of our plan that we have to do. We want to do it well. We want to make sure that everyone's comfortable coming back in. And that's our staff as well as our students. Um, we know that everybody is going through an awful lot of changes and trying to make our way through finding our path to starting school over again um, in a comfortable
comfortable way. So one of the other things that we didn't talk about a whole lot, but it is also in our plan is athletics. And we do know that athletics right now, you can't have any practices until the 21st of September. So that goes along with our idea of that slower starts as well. As soon as we get any kind of an update and that gets changed in any way, we will make sure we communicate that with our entire school community as well. There have been some questions about orientations and I know we touched on that earlier this evening. Um, orientations will be very different and we will have a variety of modes of instruction so that students who are new to a building, think about a junior, senior high school that are seventh graders, eighth graders and ninth graders, half the building, are brand new to the building. So we have a lot of orientation to do, but that's true in our other schools too. So there's a lot of newness and um, it's newness for some of our staff for working with colleagues they've never worked with before in the school district. So we have a lot of orientations to do and we're going to make sure we do that well. So there'll be multiple modes of instruction. We're going to do our best to have um, links to things that are video modules that people can watch over and over again and, and watch at their convenience as well to make those the best first days of school possible. So right now we've ended up with, well, I think our, our um, discussion itself was about an hour. We we're trying to be an hour. We're a little bit over, but I know there might be a couple of questions that we have not reached. We do want to make sure that we keep those questions coming and that we have that opportunity to answer them. So I wanna make everyone aware of a new email address we have in the school district. And it's very simple. It's just questions at johnstownschools.org. Again, that's questions at johnstownschools.org. And that is for you. It's for you to ask those questions that maybe you don't know who to call and you don't know who to ask. If you have a question about a reopening plan or something that maybe you heard about and it's kind of a rumor control. So you want to know, is this true or is this not true? And you know, with various people in the school district and some people changing roles, it's hard to tell who do I ask this question to? So if you send it to questions, we'll make sure that we get an answer to it and we'll add those questions to our frequently asked question or our FAQ document and keep that live and keep adding to it. That way, we'll all have the right information and your questions will get answered as soon as we can. If you wanted to provide your name and any kind of a contact information back, we'll make sure that we answer you personally as quickly as we can. So we thought this might be a good way to get that um, back and forth and to get those questions answered as quickly as we can. I know next week we'll have another meeting similar to this and get into some of those other portions of the plan that we didn't get the opportunity to talk about tonight in detail. And um, hopefully, say hopefully, we'll have an update from our governor so we'll know a little bit more about uh, what, will, what, it will, what it will look like on those first few days of school. But I do thank you for your um, participation here this evening. I uh, thank you for all the questions that we have already that we can try and answer. And my special thanks to our entire cabinet, all the administrators in the district who have been looking at those questions and answering those questions and helped to prepare this presentation for all of you this evening. It, um, you know, it's a wonderful team that we have here who are really student focused. And I know that nothing is going to be perfect, but it's going to be the best that we can do given the circumstances that we have right now. I think we have time for a couple of questions. It looks like someone with the phone number ending in 58. No, I'm sorry, 48. You're unmuted. Do you have a question for us? I, I actually, I do. I do have a question. First okay. thing is this. I'm not understanding why parents do not have a parent advocacy part of this plan. Okay, tell, uh, what do you mean by a parent advocacy part of the plan? Can I? Well, because you're saying, yeah, let me let me see if I can say this a little clearer for you. What you're telling everybody is this plan's going to the state as of tomorrow. And it doesn't seem that you included any type of advocacy. You just came up with a plan with a lot of hybrid and expect parents to just be okay with this. 
And unfortunately, me looking at this plan, I'm a parent that's not okay with this. So I'm not understanding why didn't we reach out and maybe get somebody that could be an advocate for the parents where they can get a lot of the questions instead of doing through an email, waiting for a plan that's going to be already submitted so we don't lose funding by the state of New York. Because it seems like this is what this is all about, money getting this in and not actually for the students themselves, for the parents or the students. It's supposed to be a whole team here, teachers, parents, students. Okay, thank you for the question, and I'll do my best to answer that. It's not that we're just doing something for the funding. Um, I know that it might look that way or seem that way, but all school districts were to put together a plan to reopen. So in order for us to reopen, we had to have a plan. We all had to have this plan with a very short window of putting it together. So we did reach out to our parent leaders and from our parent groups, and that was both our JEPTA and the PTSA. So we took our um, parent leadership groups, reached out to those leaders to help us with part, portions of that plan. This wasn't a plan that we could necessarily um, have large groups of people giving a lot of input to because of this very short turnaround. But I think what you heard us say also is that this plan is very fluid. This is the best we can do with our given conditions right now. But the plan is going to change, as we had said a number of times. When we were finalizing this plan, it's finalizing our first iteration of our reopening plan. And that plan will change. We know that it will change. It might even change, as we had mentioned earlier this evening, before September. But we did have to get something in. So we very quickly went, started pouring through the guidance documents that we were given and did our best to understand what was required of us as well as what some of those best practices were. So we have accomplished that and we've accomplished putting our plan together. And at this point, we're sharing what we have as those components of the plan. And what that meant for every school district is we did have to put those three components together. We had to have a plan for remote instruction for that virtual learning. We had to have a plan for what face-to-face -face would look like and given those parameters, how we could do that which really forced us to spend more time as we had heard this evening in looking at our hybrid plan because we can't bring everyone back together right now with the given parameters that we have, including the 50% capacity in any given room. So that um, made a big difference on whether we were able to bring everyone back at once. It's, it's, not, it's not going to be okay with a lot of people, I'm sure. But right now, this is the best plan that we're able to put together with these parameters. And there will be opportunities as we refine it. And that's why we have, we're capturing those questions, why we're capturing questions through this email address, and why we're going to have more forums where we can get this kind of an input uh, more personally to help make changes where we might be able to make those changes. But we're certainly going to be uh, listening, bringing as much input as we can but we couldn't wait for that first. It was a very quick turnaround in getting things ready for this first iteration. And um, you know, I hope that part of it at least can be, if not completely accepted, at least be understood. And I thank you for your question. We have someone else who has a question they'd like to unmute themselves and ask that question. I think we have time for a couple more. Are gonna get down with one more? Yes, um, to kind of piggyback on the, uh, um, the other gentleman's uh, question regarding the parent advocacy, um, I noticed that last night the school board uh, went into the executive session uh, to, to vote on some issues, and we're talking about, um, you know, the, the amount of social distancing that's going to be required for the Johnstown students to return to school, that there was a, a, an addendum that was on there voting for uh, educating Pacico students. If we're going to be providing education for Paseco students um, and we don't have enough to room to, uh, to house our own students, how, how is that going to work and how is that going to affect uh, the, the students that are already in our school district? Okay, thank you for the question. Um, there isn't The reason why we have gone into executive session um, didn't have to do with social distancing. I think at the beginning of your question, you had mentioned something about that. 
the, the reason for it was stated that it was a personnel matter. And that, that was the reason why the board had gone into executive session at the beginning. You are correct in saying later on in the, in the meeting, there were a number of contracts and memoranda of agreement that had been um, voted on and had been accepted. We do take in students from two districts and someone who's been here longer than I can correct me. One is uh, Pacico, and then we also have students who come in from Wheelerville that um, Wheel Wheelerville High School students are part of our program, but they're part of our program and they've been part of our program and they've been part of our planning and um, they're part of our school district. So what they were um, voting on it, it last evening is part of that agreement, but it wasn't the first time this agreement has been in place. So those students, just like those Wheelerville, Wheelerville students have been a part of our school district, um, just like other students who live in Johnstown are. Did I miss any other group, Mrs. Cook, that uh, we have that kind of a relationship with or agreement? No, we've had other uh, agreements in the past, but those are the, the two main schools we're working with right now. And I don't want to have the idea out there that they're taking the place of other students. It's, um, they are not sending, first of all, the number of students that can make that happen where it would have that kind of effect. The effect really has to do with all of our students. When you think of a classroom that has, uh, let's say, 24 students in it, we don't have the capacity to have a six foot distance uh, between students and have social distancing within our classrooms, right? So we would have to have two classes for every one class. And in order to do that, we have to have two different classrooms for those classes and then two teachers because you need staff to, um, to teach and to supervise those children. And we don't have double the teachers and double the classrooms to be able to do that. So it was very quickly that we came to that uh, conclusion that we, we just don't have the capacity, not because of any one group of students coming to our school, but just because of the way school is set up right now and the, um, the way that our classes are divided and the, the way that we have, um, that we've been doing school. We haven't had school classrooms of, on the average of 14, which is about what we can fit inside a classroom, 14 to 15 students and still maintain that distance. A real good question. We do have time for one more. Does someone else have a question they'd like to bring up? Yes, hello, Dr. Galen, can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, thank you very much. Um, my question is regarding um, the virtual aspect of everything. Now, I've, it's my understanding that what, after I read the document and was able to attend the board meeting virtually last evening. I did hear and I did read that it states uh, virtual, full virtual learning, uh, if this hybrid model is, it does indeed go into effect, virtual learning as a whole, as a full option, will not be uh, available to parents. Now, my question to you is this, and I'm sure that I am not the only family in this area or even in this town who has this significant situation. In our household, for example, we have multiple people who are seriously immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. We cannot, okay, we cannot take the chance of sending our children into the school because of the fact if they come home and they carry something, they transmit it, you're not only taking, you're not just taking out one parent, you could potentially be taking out two parents let alone children. So my question is this, if, they, if the district is not able to or will not, will not provide um, full virtual option for learning, because vir virtual learning uh, is being offered five days a week, Monday through Friday, regardless whether or not simultaneous in-person uh, instruction, in-class instruction is being provided, mm -hmm. okay? Could it not be offered on a case-by-case -case basis, specifically for those of us who have severely immunocompromised individuals in our homes? Mm -hmm. because, because, frankly, there really is, there is there's no guarantee, and I'm, I'm sorry, because there's no guarantee that at-home health screenings will truthfully be conducted regardless what you said last night that we do have to own accountability we do have to own up our, to our truthfulness with regard to travel with regard to to vitals checks etc before you send your kids into school 
you know. Well, uh, and I thank you for the question. And I know that um, not everyone, for sure, but there are, are others that are feeling the same way that you're feeling and have those kinds of um, situations of either someone in the family who is immunocompromised or there are other reasons that um, that you that this is much more concerning about going face to face. Right? Not everyone feels that way or not everyone has the same kind of situation for sure. But you're right. There are situations and there will be allowances and there is something in the plan for that as well. I think um, when we were talking about those three parts of the plan, it's we're really speaking about on the whole for the majority of our students. Right? Because we also heard from Mrs. Lent earlier that there are some pockets of students where we're trying to uh, have ways that those students can come in four days during that week and um, instead of the two days. So they could be basically in a purple group and a gold group at the same time. And um, what you're talking about, out, about is just the opposite. And there will, we will have some people in that boat as well. And yes, there will be allowances for it. Uh, but we do have a plan for, on the whole, this hybrid situation, and we have a plan for, on the whole, virtually, if we have to shut down. Um, you're right that we would be able to figure that out. And then what we need to do, now that we have these plans in place, is tease out exactly how many students and what would that look like and deal with the staffing and, um, you know, for what courses and for what grade level and work that out. There are a lot of those details, just like when Mrs. Cook was talking about details with transportation, that are coming up very soon as well. This is the bulk of the sketch of the plan, and we know that there will be, um, there will be, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Gosh, I've had a lot of 12-hour days lately, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah, but there will be allowances, I guess I'm thinking of, made for certain situations. And, you know, we're going to be paying very close attention to those needs. We're trying to meet the needs of all of our students as best we can. And when I said that won't be perfect, I mean that plan isn't going to fit perfectly for everybody. But as we always have, we try to meet the needs of the individual in our school district. And um, we're looking to partner with all of you to make sure that we do the best that we can to meet the needs that you have. So we're going to ask uh, and figure out a way that we can get that communication going with you and with other families to know exactly um, who you are and how we can meet those needs under whatever kinds of guidelines we have at the moment. So don't worry about that. Um, we're going to find our way through it, but um, we're going to have to put up put together some kind of a mechanism to capture that and be able to talk to you about it and put it in place for those families where we need to do that. Okay, I thank you very much for answering the questions. I do appreciate it. And thank you to you and the rest of the panel. Oh, well, thank you very much. And I thank everyone this evening. It's a little after eight o'clock and um, I don't want to be stumbling over my words as it gets later and I get more and more tired. Well, there are an awful lot of things we can talk about, but don't think that this is the last time that we're going to be discussing it. And uh, we do really appreciate your participation this evening, for your concern, and for your partnership above and beyond anything else. And I wish you a very safe evening. Anything that we can do, please use that questions at johnstownschools.org, and we'll be looking forward to talking to you very, very soon. Thank you, and good night. Thank you.